Hi there, folks. We are back here, and I want you to fill you in that you should worry about this chapter that we are covering. So, the chapter in the book. So, you gotta worry about chapter 13, okay, which is temperature and the ideal gas law as well. This is just a brief introduction, just to warm you up to what is gonna come. But what is important, here you go, chapter 13.1, temperature and thermal equilibrium. I already described that for you. And including this simple experiment that you can perform that can be used to determine the temperature of an object using our senses. Okay, and the law of thermodynamics, zero law of thermodynamics, which is also related to this experiment simple experiment that we're doing. You have to worry about temperature scales. We go. We have the Celsius and the Fahrenheit temperature scale. Their relationships. Thermal expansion. We cover thermal expansion as well. How Substances expand with increasing temperature. Most substances do expand with increasing temperature. And there are a few odd balls out there that do not expand. They contract. And it's possible also to create devices, uh, materials that do not expand at all or do not contract at all with temperature. But what you have to know is that most substances out there, they expand with increasing temperature. Whether it's the length, whether it's the area, whether it is the volume. You have to worry about this section as well. And we have that the number of molecules in a substance is going to be the mass of the substance divided by the molecular mass of the substance. The average density of the substance would be the number of N, the number of molecules N divided by the volume which is the density divided by the molecular mass. Here is a model of how gas, gases behave in a container. They can be seen, envisioned as small particles that are moved back and forth with a given velocity. They, their mass is so small that they force of gravity can be neglected, okay? Their mass is so small and their velocity is so large that they, their weight can be neglected. The gravitational force can be neglected. What we do know is that one mole of a given substance is going to have six, you know, this number, this large number of molecules or atoms inside it, one mole. So the total number of molecules or atoms per, per number, number per, and the number per mole, the Avogadro's number is equal to the number of moles. That's something you have seen in physics, in physics, in chemistry. So just to remind you quickly about this quantity. And don't forget mole is a is a basic quantity in physics. You have to worry about this chapter as well. I have already discussed part of this chapter in in the lecture and also in the lab right 
absolute temperature and the ideal gas law. Now going back to my notes. So material that you have to worry so far, book. Sections and material in the book is 13.1. 13 13.3 13.5 okay we're going to cover 13.6 as well we are not going to worry about the rest okay so all the way up to 13.6 no more than that no more than that so we study those chapters and let's update our building blocks of physics right we have temperature is a building block we have amount of a substance and the unit of the amount of substance is the mole. Going back to our book. Okay, so... I told you already about the gas thermometer, right? And there are all sorts of gas, let's see, there are at least three gas thermometers. And those gas thermometers use the ideal gas law. The ideal gas law explains how a, how a gas thermometer works. Let me give you some examples of gas thermometer that we have there in the internet. Here, I like this video right in here. That's the simplest of all videos that we have out there. And, you know, we have other videos here about a gas thermometer. Okay, so here you go. But let's take a look at this one here. It's kind of gas liquid thermometer, this one I want to show you. Here you go, this one right in here. I had just started as an engineer working on the International Space Station. Here you go. So here you go. What we have right in here is a container that has a liquid. A liquid with a dye. Can be water, can be can be alcohol. And then to make it things easier to see. If the water is transparent, it's going to become very difficult for you to see the water, right? So what people do, they put a dye in there to make it colored like that very easily. So what's happening here? We have this bottle. We have air around inside this bottle. And on the top of that, we seal this, the, the bottle with this clay. And on the top of that, we also have this straw. The top of the straw is opened. Okay, the only place that sealed is around this straw. And how does this thermometer work? Okay, well, this guy is holding the bottle with his hand and his hand is transferring heat to the air that's inside the bottle. We, we want the bottle to be completely sealed right here. The straw doesn't touch the bottom of the bottle okay it must be the opening of the straw should be somewhere around here shouldn't be closed here the top of the straw should not be closed either the only thing that's sealed is this region around the straw so as you are the bottle warms up what happens the air that is around the straw inside the bottle gets warmed as well, it expands, the pressure inside the bottle increases, and the increase in the pressure here in this water, force in this liquid, forces the liquid to rise in the straw. Okay, it all comes from 
ideal gas law. That's one possible thermometer. I would say this, this is a, a constant volume thermometer. It works like a constant volume thermometer because we have this gas here around that remains almost in the same, uh, almost with constant volume. So let's continue playing this video. Okay, same thing here. All right, same same principle. This container is full seal, fully sealed with the cap, and we also have this clay that seals around the straw. Don't forget this: the top of the straw must be open, must remain open, so we can have just one atmosphere at the top and uh, a pressure that's gonna vary here inside that's gonna go become higher than the the atmospheric pressure that's uh here they explain how to make those those thermometers it's not a thermometer it's more like a what you saw in there is more like a thermoscope a thermometer is a device that has a scale as well. What you saw doesn't have a scale, but a scale can be put in there and then you have to calibrate for different temperatures. Okay, so what you have is more like a thermoscope, which can be turned into a thermometer if you put a scale and calibrate for a given temperature, for a given temperature scale. So let's see, now straw, clay, and two different containers plus the liquid, we need the liquid as well. Here you go, water. So you can put some dyes in the water, but you can use, in this case, you can, uh, if you're going to use water, you can buy some of those coloring dyes that we buy at, uh, that are sold at grocery stores. I have a bunch of them here at home. And make your water colored or you know if you want if you like wine or coke you can use wine and coke in your thermometer as well because they they have a color it's easy to see the liquid as it rises along the along the straw if the clay is sealing the surrounding of the clay of the straw is putting Bottle, you go make sure that the straw doesn't touch the bottom of the doesn't touch the bottom of the container, but it is still submerged in the liquid. Okay, so that one that's our first thermometer is ready to be used. Now he's gonna make the second thermometer with this other container. He drew a roll, a hole. Again, gotta make sure that we seal any holes around this straw. There you go. The cap must seal the container as well. Tight sealing. Now his hand is transferring heat to the air inside. Kelvin or Fahrenheit. Now 
now if it's gonna cool down the container, you're going to see that the, the level of the liquid is gonna go down. The gas inside the bottle is, contra is decreasing its pressure. Okay, the video is accelerated by 30 times. So that's a very simple thermometer that we can make at home. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, the other ones that I mentioned to you. You know, there is also, but let's take a look first here at the, at the book. I told you about the gas thermometer before, right? This is what we saw is also a gas thermometer. There's another way of making gas thermometers. That is what we call constant pressure gas thermometer and constant volume gas thermometer. What you saw there, it's like a constant volume. What you saw in the illustration is a constant volume gas thermometer in the simulation, in the, in the video. Okay, here is not a constant volume because the volume is varying, right? But we also have the constant pressure gas thermometer. This is a constant pressure gas thermometer. What you have right in here is a constant volume, another configuration of the constant volume gas thermometer. So what do you do in this gas thermometer? Take a look at flex. It, it, this, this is a gas thermometer that uh, I have worked with there at the Santa Monica College. Works very well. Okay, so you have a, a rigid container, can be glass, and you put a gas here inside, can be air, can be oxygen, can be helium, can be hydrogen, can be whatever gas you want, you can put here inside. It's a glass tube connected to a hose, okay? And this hose connects to another glass tube. Rigid, rigid and flexible, okay? So in this type of thermometer, what do we do? We keep this volume here constant, okay? We keep this volume, and I have a video that shows exactly how it's done. The end is open, just like the other one. The end is open. So let's take a look at the video. I have a constant, it doesn't, the video, I couldn't find a good video for the constant volume gas thermometer, okay? It shows the video, the good, the best video that I saw, like, that, that I saw, shows only part of the device. Here you go, that's the one that I saw. Gas thermometer at constant volume. What you see here is another gas thermometer too. I'm going to show you the later on. It's similar to that one that you saw. Okay, so let's take a look at this one. There are, you know, the video doesn't show everything, unfortunately. But uh, if you understood how the gas thermometer, a constant volume works, you know, and the components, let's, let's go click, click it here. So now we're going to see the go. gas thermometer working. So we're going to raise the... So here you go. Do you remember that bulb that I told you? The glass bulb is this one here. This glass bulb is connected to this other glass. Okay, so just go back to that illustration in the book. Let me, you know, it's, there, there's some illustration missing. This guy here is directly connected to this one with glass. Okay, it's a rigid glass that goes from this bulb all the way down to this region here. This one is connected to this one. At the bottom here, we have the flexible holes. And then we have this other glass tubing on the left side. Two glass tubings, right? This tubing connect to the bulb. This tubing, just separate one. Just like you saw in the illustration. I'm going to show you the illustration again. In the book. Here you go. 
in the video, this bulb is on the right side. So it's like a mirror image. This bulb, this part here is on the right side. The tube, glass tube that you saw on the right side is this one here, is this part. And the, the video doesn't show this part here, unfortunately, which is also rigid. But it does show this other tubing. Also shows the flexible tube. So let's go ahead. So what this guy is going to do is going to submerge this bulb in hot water, warm water. Gas. And then watch, watch what's happening. Here you go. Note, oh, in addition to that, what, I, what I'm forgetting to tell you, we also have a liquid here inside. The liquid that we have is mercury. And it's set at zero. See that? It's set at zero. A liquid mercury. You know, it doesn't have to be a liquid mercury. It can be you know, that liquid that we saw before, colored water. It can be wine. It can be coke, right? But people prefer to use mercury. Here you go. Let's see what's going to happen. We'll raise more water into the gas, and the gas will expand. Notice we've got the starting levels of the mercury with the two arrows there. Then as the warm water heats the gas, the gas will expand. So do you see what's happening? The That's the mercury going down because the gas that is in between this bulb and this region here of the capillar, capillary is expanding. Right now, it's, it's not constant volume. The thermometer is not constant volume because the gas is expanding, right? Because the gas is expanding, this side, this part of the thermometer is lowering and this other part of the thermometer is rising. So for now, it's not constant volume yet because, because the volume here in this region, in the right side of the region of the thermometer is, is, is changing. The volume of the gas in this right side. But let, let, let's see what we do to keep a, a constant volume. You're going to see. Go go. Down on the right hand side, going down. on the left hand side. But this will also increase the pressure as well as the increasing volume. So. When it... Don't forget, the, all this concept use the ideal gas law. If you were to discover the ideal gas law, you'd have to perform experiments like that. Okay? There's a gas inside and some, some way to control the temperature. And measuring the volume. Let's keep going. Equilibrium and they eventually the, eventually the whole more. thing is going to equilibrate. What we will do is come along, have... we'll grab the left hands thermal equilibrium, right? You're going to reach thermal equilibrium. ...side of the tube and lift it, further increasing the height of the mercury, increasing the pressure, which will then force the mercury on the right-hand side to come back to the level that it started at. Now that you wait long enough, you can turn this device into a constant volume thermometer by adjusting the lower part of your thermometer where you have the flexible hosing. Let's say, let's see. That's happening now. Here you go. See, now when, when I it adjust, gets to the... the guys adjust the, the tube on the left side so he can control the height of this mercury until it goes back at zero position to get a constant volume thermometer. Here you go. The level that it's starting at, Here you go. Take a look. we can see on the left-hand side the height difference of the mercury, and from that we can calculate. Okay. So now we reach a point in which this guy, is, this thermometer is working as a constant volume thermometer. It's not constant pressure because the pressure here is higher than the pressure here. The pressure here is higher than the atmospheric pressure here. The, uh, the pressure right here at this spot is going to be one atmospheric pressure because this tube is open to the atmosphere. So here's going to be a little bit more than one atmosphere. And the difference in height here between those two mercury 
in this case, you know, 60 units, right? Zero to 60 units is related to the temperature, is related to the pressure, and is related to the temperature. So let's go. Okay, like so how do you calibrate this thermometer? How do you calibrate this? You already have a scale. You have a scale in the thermometer. It's no longer a thermoscope. It's a thermometer. And now you have to go the next step that's calibrate the thermometer. Right? In order to calibrate the thermometer, you have to create a scale. So let's say just like the centig the Celsius scale. The Celsius scale says that at one atmospheric pressure, zero degrees C is ice water, and a hundred degrees C is boiling water. So you get your standard. Your standard is ice water for zero degrees, and a uh, and uh, boiling water for a hundred degrees, and you determine, you, you write down the scale right in here, and you have also to ensure, you know, to assure that this scale is linear as well. The thermometer behaves linearly. Not every thermometer is going to behave linearly, but most of the time, yeah, they do. I work with instruments, I work developing new instruments, and sometimes I get surprised, I, I myself feel surprised that many of the instruments that I create that doesn't exist, that didn't exist, and now exist because I invented them, they ended up to be linear. It's, it's amazing, okay? Some of them, they're not. But let's go ahead. New pressure that the gas is under at the same volume. So, so now we can see the... That's the thermometer at constant volume, constant gas thermometer at constant volume. Okay, and you can perform this experiment with different gases. The easiest way to perform this experiment is to perform with air. Huh? When you're building this thermometer, before you put the mercury right in here, you just collect air from ambient air and then put together your device. But you can also put other, other gases there. You can put helium, you can put hydrogen, you can put oxygen, pure oxygen pure CO2, you can put pure nitrogen, and so on. And all those gases behave in that linear way, that I, linear fashion that you saw. Okay, so let me close this one here. That's... So let's go back to the book. Remember that I, I showed that graph to you? So it behaves in a linear fashion like that against temperature. Can be pressure or can be volume. For constant pressure gas, you know, all those gases behave in this in a, in a linear fashion. And they all, when you extrapolate those lines, they all converge to a point that we call the absolute zero temperature, zero Kelvin. They all converge to this point. It doesn't matter how dense the gas is. It doesn't matter what type of gas is. So that's how people discovered the absolute zero, the zero Kelvin. It's very difficult to achieve to, to, to reach this point, absolute zero. Okay, I explained that as well. And we have the ideal gas law that we cover in the lab, right? PV is proportional to T, and then we have a constant here. That's one way to write this equation. Okay, I prefer to write as NRT, PV equal to NRT, and is the number of moles of the gas. R is a universal constant. T is the temperature. You are going to be solving some problems with this relation. So let's let's cover this example here, okay? Let's cover this example right in here in the book. It's a very good example. So I'm going to, so what, what we have here? We have here a tire, a tire in the car. 
So you make sure the tire of your car is properly inflated. And you determine that the gauge pressure of your car, of your tire, is around 31 pounds per square inch. PSI, we call it PSI, pounds per square inch. Okay? But don't forget, this is the gauge pressure. Okay, there's a difference between gauge pressure and absolute pressure, right? From the course Physics 120, we covered that. So how do we convert PSI into Pascal? Okay, there's a conversion. And 31 square PSI is 214 kilopascal. And the temperature is 15 degrees. Okay? After a few hours of highway driving, what happens? Your tire is rotating, right? And because your tire is rotating, it's moving, it's, it's undergoing friction with the highway with the pavement of the highway, and the temperature of the tire increases. If it was initially a uh, temperature, that's why, you know, before, and when you, the temperature of your tire increases, what's going to happen? If the volume of the tire remains constant, the, the, the pressure is going to increase. That's what's happening here. That's real life. That's why they tell you, before, you know, that you have to measure the pressure of the tire of, of your car before you start driving. That's what you use as a standard for the pressure in your tire. Okay, so you have all those three parameters, the pressure, the volume, and the temp temperature. In the case of the tire of your car, the volume of your tire remains constant. But the pressure and the temperature, if the temperature changes, the pressure is going to change because of the temperature. Okay? And that goes according to the ideal gas law. So let's take a, a look here, example 15, and I'm going to do some drawings as well. Going back to ideal gas law. We cover the ideal gas law in the lab, so I'm not gonna spend too much time here. Okay, so just remember, you gotta. And let's and let's put it here. It's not exactly a law. Okay, put it between quotes. It was a law when it was discovered, but today we can derive it mathematically. But we're not gonna go through the trouble of deriving this law here, this so-called law, this relation equation. P T V equal to N R T. Okay. Example in the book. tire of your car has a constant volume. The volume of the car doesn't, the volume of the tire doesn't expand, doesn't contract, unless of course you lose air, right? So, so what you have, you measure before you drive the car, car, you measure the pressure gauge of the tire and find it to be 31 psi. I'm just rephrasing the problem there. 31 psi, which is 214 kilopascal or 214 kilopascal. And then after you go drive, you drive the car for some time, you drive the car for some time. Oh, by the way, there is also a temperature, right? At a temperature of 15 degrees C. the environmental temperature. We are assuming that the temperature of the tire is the same as the temperature around it 
before you drive the tire. You drive the car for some time, stop it, measure the gauge pressure again, and find that it increased to how much? Let's take a look there. 35 psi to 41. 35 psi or 241 kilopascal. The question that he makes is what's the temperature of the air in the tires now? Okay, what's the temperature in the of the air inside the tire now? The moment you stop the car, you go ahead and you measure the gauge pressure of the tire. So let's take a look at the solution. We are going to do a drawing of the situation. Okay, so I'm going to illustrate a tire as being a container, a container for the gas, for the air that's inside. Let's get this thing here. Let me get my PowerPoint. P37. This one right in here. Let's go all the way down. So the situation is like that. Here we go. Okay, so let's say my tire is just a container like that, right? It's a container that has a gas molecules there inside. Okay, I'll, I'll leave like that. Initially, let's not forget the pressure gauge, the gauge pressure. Gauge pressure is 214 K Pascal. There is a difference between gauge pressure and Absolute pressure, right? We cover that in physics 120. I'm going to tell you what the difference very soon, just to remind you. The temperature is 15 degrees C. You do not know the volume. You do not know the volume of the tire. You do not know the number of moles of the gas in the tire. Okay, and then let's see later on. Let's uh, let's put it at t equal to zero, right? T equal to zero seconds. It's like that. And then later on, after driving the car. That's how you illustrate, you know, T equal to T1, which is greater than zero, by the way. That's how you illustrate the problem. So you can grasp. Huh. Greater than zero. Now the pressure increases to 241, and he's asking what's the temperature? What's the temperature of the air inside the container? In this case, the tire. Okay? Can 
can put it here, T naught. Okay, pressure gauge, G naught, right? So this is the initial pressure. Like that. That's what he's asking. Okay, so let's go back to our problem. Even better, let's use my software. My favorite software. Okay, like in here. Links. Summer, summer session, summer session two, here you go. My favorite software. It's coming alive. Okay, so conversion lab gas, gas law. Okay, so now I do gas law. Let's not forget is the equation is PV equal to NRT, right? And we can even write, we're going to have two different pressures. We have our initial pressure and final pressure. Okay, so let's say we have a different volume. Let's say we have uh, different initial molarities. R is always constant, so you cannot, you don't need to. So we have those two equations. That's my initial pressure, my initial volume, my initial gas, number of gas, mo no, number, of, number of moles of gas, right? RT naught. But like I told you, you know, in this problem, in this problem, the following parameters are constant. Okay, so here you go. V is going to be equal to V naught. The initial volume is equal to the final volume n equal to a naught, your tire, you know, doesn't let any gas escape from it. What else? That's all, right? Only V equal to V naught, only n naught, everything else is going to be different. You do not know V, you do not know N. But it doesn't mean that you cannot solve this problem. So don't feel desperate if you do not know some of the parameters that show up in the equation. So here you go, I'm going to substitute right in here. Uh-oh, something wrong. I did something wrong, let's see. Let me see if I can. Yeah, better. Now it's better. Okay. My N is also equal, right? And now I have two equations. I'm going to put them side by side. This equation side by side with this one. I'm going to move the N on the other side. I do know what is the pressure. The initial pressure is 214 kilopascal. The final pressure is 241 kilopascal. But there is one problem. There's one, one, one more problem. You know, it's, uh, it's the gauge pressure that we know. It's not the absolute pressure. The gauge pressure is different from the absolute pressure, okay? 
So what you see here is the gauge pressure. To get the absolute pressure, what do we have to do? Here you go. Let's go back to our drawing here. We have to account for the atmospheric pressure that is adding to the internal pressure in the tire. Okay? The atmospheric pressure is approximately 100,000 Pascal, approximately. I want to put that here. You got atmospheric pressure. I'm going to put it like that. A hundred thousand kilo, a uh, hundred thousand Pascal. And the absolute pressure is the sum of the gauge pressure with the outside pressure. The pressure here before you go, you drive is the same as the pressure after you stop for a break. like that. I prefer this arrowhead here. Okay, so my absolute pressure is going to be 214 kilopascal plus 100 kilopascal. It's not exactly 100, right? There's a little bit more than that. Let's see what the uh, let's see what the book used for the pressure. I'm quite sure the book used 100,000. Let's see here. Oh, he used 101. Well, let's use 101, just like the book is using. 101. 101. Go back here, I put it correctly to 101, just 1% 1 difference. Here 241, right? The volume, we do not know the volume. But we do not know that, we do know the temperature. We do know that the temperature, the initial temperature, is 15 degrees C, which by the way, we have to sum with 273 point, right? We gotta write everything in terms of SI units. Everything. So the SI unit for temperature is the Kelvin. Let's see what the exact convert. Oh, he's using just 273. Okay, good. 273 Kelvin. You go. The final temperature we do not know. We want to find out what's the temperature. Find the temperature. So let's see if we can solve the problem. We have one. Let's take, let's, uh, we have these two equations. Okay. I'm going to copy and paste there in my notes so you can follow later on. Solution. Here you go. Like that. Ideal gas law. We have two equations, two equations, and we know the following. We know P, P naught, 
T naught in R, right? We do not know, do not know the following. Okay, what we do not know, we do not know N. We do not know T, lowercase T. Oh gosh, I hate that. We do not know T, and we do not know N. What are the nons? Here you go, I put here. Nons. Anons. Anons. Oh, actually, we do not know. Yeah, let's see. Oh, we do not know V either, right? We do not know V. We do not know T. We do not know N. Here you go. We have three anons and only two equations. Okay, can you solve this problem or not? Yeah, you initially someone would say that you cannot solve this problem because you have more anons than equations. But there are under certain special circumstances, it is possible to solve those equations if you have more anons. Especially if the anons cancel out. Okay. So, so let's see if we can solve it or not. Here you go. Go back, going back here. Uh, let's let's substitute our values first. Two p naught kilopascal p, and then we worry about. Here you go. We, we worry about what we do not know, right? What else can I put there? I can put T naught right in here. All right? I'm going to put those two equations side by side with one another. Those are two independent equations. And we want to know what T is. So, there are some techniques that we can use. You know, one way to do that, let's say, let's solve, let's try to solve that for N or even for V, the one that we do not know, but we do not want to find V. Right? And something magical is going to happen, okay? Here you go, I'm going to solve for V here from this equation instead. Here you go. And something magical is going to happen. When I substitute the V here on this equation, something magical happens. Not only I eliminate V, but on the top of that, we have N here on this side and N on the other side. And the N are going to cancel out. Sometimes things like that happens in physics and math. Okay? We... We had lucky here. We found out that a parameter that we did not know, which was the N and the V, you, we didn't have to know it because of the setup of the equation itself, of the two equations. Okay? And now, here you go, I'm going to solve for T. Even the R, I don't have to worry about substituting the numerical values of R because the R is going to cancel out here. I wouldn't even have to know the value of R now. Let's solve it for T. Here you go. And let's calculate what the value 312 Kelvins. So that's the new temperature of your tire after you have driven for maybe two hours. Who knows? OK? So that's how we solve this problem, without knowing those parameters, N, V, and R. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to put my V right here. 
I'm going to reorganize this stuff like that. Okay. I'm going to put those values right here at the top. And I can go ahead. Let's finish documenting our. We have three unknowns and only two equations. In principle, we cannot solve this type of problem because we have more unknowns than equations. However, however, depending on the specific type of equation we are dealing with equations we are dealing with, comma, we can look out and still solve the problem. Okay. Because the unknowns may end up canceling along, along the way. Things like that frequently happens in physics and math. So here you go. I will copy that and paste right in here. So that's the solution of our problem. Going back, okay, did I get here 313, right? What did I get? Yeah, 312.69, and he's approximating to 313. Okay, so that's the case of uh, gas, ideal gas law for the case of constant volume. Okay. And don't forget, you know, and now he goes, the tires are 35. The, what, what's this, this other problem is all about? Okay. What this other problem is all about is just real life type of things that we find. Okay. When you measure the pressure of your tire, you must measure its pressure whenever the tire is cold. You know, you gotta wait eight hours for the tire to cool down before you measure the pressure again. Okay. So what this guy, what this practice problem is all about? You know, suppose you didn't know that. You didn't know that uh, the tire must be cold for you to measure the PSI of the tire. And then you, f you get into the mistake of decreasing the pressure in the tire from 35 PSI, like we are measuring right now, to any value between 28 and 32. To let it go back to 31. Okay. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that because when the tire really cools down, you may be below 28 pounds per inch square. But now the question is, suppose you let some air out to go back to 31 PSI. What's going to be the gauge pressure after the tires cooled uh, back down? I I'm going to go even further than that, okay? I'm going to go even further than that. Let me uh, do slightly different. So here you go. Now, example, another example. I'm going to do a step that the book should have asked you, okay? Now that the temperature of the tire of the tire is, you know, 312.7 Kelvin and the new pressure and the new pressure is 35 PSI you decide 
to lower its the tires gauge its tire gauge the tire gauge pressure to lower the tires gauge pressure to 31 psi okay To let out enough air and let out by letting out by letting out enough air from the tire. So the first question I want to ask you: What is the new value of n? Okay. On one step before we do the actual solution that the book is asking, okay? What's the new? That's something they should not do, okay? Don't think that you're not working within the specifications of the manufacturer, okay? If it is 38.5 psi, that's because the tire is hot and it didn't have time to come down in temperature to the tire didn't have time to reach thermal equilibrium with the surrounding air. Okay, if you wait long enough, this 35 psi pressure is going to go back to 31 psi. But if you do not know that, and you think you are you are operating your tire outside the manufacturer's performance. You might make this mistake and let the air out of the tire. Bleed out all the way down to 31 psi. So what's the new value of N? After, you know, you let some air out. That's the next example. Let's go back here to my problem, right? I'm going to use the same equations. New problem. New problem. New example. Bring down the pressure from 35 psi to 31 psi by letting the air out of the tire. What is the new N? Assume that the temperature of the tire remains at 3, 313, right? 313 Kelvin during this procedure. Assume that the temperature and of the tire remainder and the volume doesn't change and its volume does not change. So let's go there. Okay, so here you go. The new pressure has increased. I want, and here you go. Now, the new pressure is going to be this value is going to be the initial one right and the final pressure is going to be what was the initial in the previous problem you want to bring down the pressure from 240 the pressure gauge from 241 to 214 kilopascal the temperature here you go here you go I'm going to call the initial temperature is the final temperature that we had in the previous problem. The temperature is not going to change in the process. Okay, final temperature is going to be the same. Did I calculate and not? I didn't calculate the not right? Yeah. 
And now, you know, we have n not, and then we have n. We still do not know n not. We still do not know n. The volume, the initial volume, is going to be equal to the final volume. Those are, this is the type of information that we have. Let's line them up. Here you go. Everything that we know is here at the top. Keep it here. We do not know N naught. We do not know N. And we have the equation that we had before. Here you go. When I use those. Uh, those two equations. Like that. Okay, I have to adjust here my equation. The temperature is going to remain the same. So here you go. Instead of writing those two equations, we write T naught is equal to T, and we don't need that. So going back here to our problem, okay? We won't be able to find a new value of n, but uh, the question is, uh, what uh, the new value of n with respect to this initial value, okay? This initial value, or initial value, or in other words, how much air did you have? What's the percentage of air? What's the percentage of air you had to, to let it out? We cannot calculate the exact value in, with the information that we have, but we can find out what is the percentage of air that you let it out. Okay. So here is our equations. P not V. The volume didn't change, but the number of molecules changed. I'm going to replace numerical values for P not. Numerical value, not, not numerical value for T, but uh, we're going to use the relation that the final temperature is equal to the initial temperature. The final value of the pressure is going to change. We still have two equations, right? What do we do next? Okay, let's eliminate what we do not want to find out. We don't need to find out, let's see. No, we need, we know the temperature, right? Yeah, we can use the temperature. Here you go. We can use the temperature here. Let's see. Yeah, we have a numerical value for the temperature. Okay, so here you go. Let's get that here. numerical value for the temperature. I want to find out what N is, the new N is, right? So let's, what do we do? Okay, we eliminate, 
what we do not want to know. We do not want to know the volume. We want to find out n in function, as a function of n naught. So what do we do? To eliminate v means to solve for v in terms of some, someone else. That's what it means. And now that we know that v, what v is in terms of someone else, we can use it in the other second independent equation. Okay, I didn't substitute for r, right? But I don't need to, don't need to substitute for r. It's not necessary because it's going to cancel out in my equation. And I want to find out what n is going to be. Here you go. What n is going to be in terms of n naught. Notice that now the final. number of moles of the air is 92% of the initial. So you let approximately 7.9% of the air out. OK? Yeah, OK, so here you go. You lost, you lost approximately 7.9% percent of the air out so let's see our answer here right i don't want to know gauge pressure yet but uh, but uh, should tell us what the percentage of 7.9 percent okay let's cover it quickly and What's the gauge pressure after the tires cool back down? He's asking the gauge pressure. He's not asking the absolute pressure. Okay. So he go after the tires cool down. So he go. I'm going to copy that and paste in my notes. So that's gonna put me another problem here. I broke that down. The problem in the book in two different problems, right? Example, what will be the new gauge pressure after the tires cool down? Okay. That's what he's asking. Cools down to room temperature, which is 15 degrees C. Go back down, cool down, back to 15 degrees C. Okay. So let's go. Let's do the. What's the new pressure after the tire cool down? The air in the tire, okay? Air in the tire cools down to. 15 degrees C. So you know the new pressure, the initial pressure, which is 31 psi. But don't forget, is we gotta treat it as a not a gauge pressure. We gotta treat it as a Absolute pressure. Yep. No, wait a minute. No, it's this one here. What was the final pressure in the previous problem becomes the initial pressure in the new problem. Okay. He's asking you what is the final pressure? The initial temperature is, is still that one that we got. The final temperature is going to be this one here, 15 degrees Kelvin, 15 degrees C plus, right, 15 degrees C. You got to change it to Kelvin. You got to add. What else do we need? The volume is going to remain constant. You go. I'm going to just copy that and paste it here. 
the volume is not going to change. And we found that the N is a fraction. That's what it used to be, right? We're going to use, so let's see here. Yeah, we're going to use like that. It's like that. But N is going to be constant anyway. Well, you know what? Let's put N equal to a naught. Okay. He go, he not, he, he go. We use the same equations as before. Is asking what is the new final pressure. Let's see if we can solve that. Yeah, V is equal to V naught, so here we go. I already put that here. We do not have to worry, but now we don't let any air go out. It's going to be a different N, okay? So you, we might want, because it's a different N, we might want to use it as lowercase n prime. Just just to understand that's going to be a different numerical value. All right? And I don't even need that. So let's go ahead and substitute our values, P naught. Yeah. Let's put the T naught right here as well. Let's substitute, we do not know P. Let's put T right in here. Okay. Here's my system of equations. There are two equations. And let's see if we can solve this problem. Let's solve it in terms of the unknowns, right? Here you go. The unknown is the the unknown, the unknown that we do not want to find out, which is the V. We use that unknown that we got from one of the equations in the other equation. We have two, you know, independent equations. We want to find the pressure, right? Don't, don't keep track, don't lose track of what you want to know of what you want to find out. So let's see, let's solve for the P, let's see if we can get any result. Yeah, it looks like we're gonna do that, right? Oh, N prime is gonna cancel out with N prime, R is gonna cancel out with R. So let's see what's gonna be the new pressure. 290.13 kilopascal. Hey, but wait a minute, this is not our gauge pressure, this is our absolute pressure. Right? The gauge pressure we go, is going to be P minus 101 kilopascal. So let's go ahead and substitute it here. And then we've got to change that to PSI. But anyway, no, let's not. We don't need to do, to do that. We don't need to. We can compare to what we had initially. Okay, that's the initial pressure from the very first problem. I'm gonna even going to get the exact numerical value. Here you go, 315 kilopascal. You are at, see? Oh, wait a minute. Sorry, shouldn't do that. It was supposed to be 214, okay? It was supposed to be 214 in the gauge pressure. 
And now you're not 214 anymore, you're at 189. So you made a mistake by letting the air go out. Most likely this is well below 28 PSI. Let's see how many PSI that is. You gotta make a, you gotta make a conversion, right? Yep. Yeah. 31 PSI is Thirty-one PSI is two hundred fourteen kilopascal. Okay, we can use that. Thirty-one PSI. Thirty-one PSI is two hundred fourteen kilopascal. So we can solve for kilopascal in terms of PSI, we substitute that here and let's say, yeah, you went down, you went below 28 PSI. You don't want to operate your car at a pressure less than 28 PSI. Just by letting the air out of your tire. Okay? You're converting, you go. That's what we're doing here. We're converting from kilopascal to PSI. Okay, so let's see. Let's copy and paste it there in our solution. That's what we have for those problems. Here we go. Let's see if we have another interesting problem that we can this problem here, you know, I, I read about this problem and there's some missing information in there, okay? Unfortunately, he didn't provide us with everything that we're supposed to know, okay? But he gives you, so, see, that was the important information that he left out. The driver breathes the same volume per minute underwater, okay? He was supposed to give us this information there in the formulation of the problem. Sometimes you saw, you see problems like that, in which the, the book doesn't provide all the information that we're, they're supposed to get, okay? So let's go to the next chapter, Higokinetic Theory of Ideal Gas. And let's take a little break. And I will be back. We're not, we're not going to cover the kinetic theory of ideal gases, which is section 13.6. Okay, so, well, the book, what we want to do here is the following. We want to, to relate the ideal gas law with the kinetic energy of the gas itself. That's why it's called kinetic theory of ideal gas. We want to find out how the kinetic energy of a gas relates to the pressure, relates to its pressure. We can develop a model and it starts like that. Just remember that a gas, take a look at your book, okay? And a gas are just can be modeled as little particles, point particles that move in every possible direction in a random fashion. Okay, we do not have molecules, gas molecules, they all move in the same direction all the time. No, 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 that's not how it, it works. One molecule is going to move in one direction, another molecule is going to move in another direction, and other direction, and so on. And their direction of motion is random for each molecule for each particle in the gas. So if this molecule here is moving in this direction, this other one is gonna be moving in this direction here, and this other one in this direction. So it would be like a random motion of each, each one of those particles, okay? Keep that in mind. And the 
assumption that we are making is that those molecules, they do not interact with one another. In a molecule that's in a gas that's diluted enough, there is no force, no long range force between the molecules. They don't even collide because the gas is so diluted. There is no, no way, there, there, there is no room for them to collide. The only collisions that happens is between the walls of the container and those collisions are totally elastic collisions. That's, that's the type of model that we're doing because if you weren't to totally elastic collision, those molecules would slow down as time goes by, right? They would collide here and after the collision you slow down, but that's not what we see in nature. What we see in nature is that the collisions between the molecules and the walls of the container are totally elastic and there is no loss in energy. So let's, let's start here with our kinetic theory of gas. One, you know, model, model. Gas molecules in a container can be considered as point particles. that have only translational energy. They don't have rotational energy. They don't have vibrational energy. That's the simplest type of uh, model that we're gonna get out there. And yet, it explains very well many gases out there. Okay. In, a, in an ideal gas, the molecules are diluted enough so they, no, let's say in an ideal gas, the gas is diluted enough so the molecules do not interact with them, with, with themselves at all, at all. Okay, no long, in, in other words, there is no long range forces, no electrostatic forces, no gravitational forces, no electrostatic forces, no gravitational forces. Molecules, they don't attract each other due to gravitation. Molecules, they don't attract each other due to electrical force. Molecules, molecules don't repel each other due, due to electrical forces. No collisions between molecules because they're, because they're small enough. And very important, the only collision we have collisions we have is are the collisions with the walls of the container which are totally elastic we have conservation in other words we have conservation of energy totally elastic collisions you conserve kinetic energy, remember that? So, what else? Which other assumption? Here we go. Motion of the molecules are random. That's another assumption, important assumption. That is, what means it's random? That is, no preferential direction of motion. If you have one molecule moving along the horizontal direction, there will be 
another molecule moving along the vertical direction. So if you have those two molecules moving along those two directions, there will be another molecule moving along this third direction, this third perpendicular direction. They will have those components spread out uniformly throughout the whole gas. They are not going to move everybody in tandem in the same direction, in the horizontal direction all the time. That's not going to happen, something like that. Those are the assumptions of this model. And from this simple assumption, we can come up with some very important results that relates the kinetic energy of the gas with the pressure of the gas. Okay, so let's go back here. The, the pressure, you know, very important, the pressure of the gas on the, the pressure of the gas on the walls of the container. That's another important assumption here that I'm going to put here in the is due to collisions. The pressure of the gas on the container, here you go, on the container, is due to collisions of the molecules against the wall of the container, the walls of the container. That's what you have to assume. That's what how we. We are going to relate the pressure against the velocity. Okay. Think about that. The faster the molecule, the molecule hits the wall of the container, the stronger is going to be its force that it applies, right? And because the force is stronger, the pressure is related to the stronger. Is is related to the force. The stronger the force, the higher the pressure. Remember, the pressure is related to the force, right? You go, pressure is force divided by area. Remember that? That's the relationship between the pressure and the force. So, every time that a molecule collides against the walls of the container, from a it applies a force to the container which is measured as a pressure. And now the question is how we are going to find that out? How we are going to find this force and from this force how we are going to find out the pressure? Okay? And that what is the crucis of this chapter. I can tell you right away that the book got the right answer using the wrong derivation. Okay? There are some things here that are correct that the book did, but then there are other things that are incorrect. And I'm going to point out exactly what it is, what is incorrect. What you see right in here is what happens to a molecule that is approaching the wall of a container, of the container. This molecule has a velocity component along the horizontal direction and a velocity component along the vertical direction. Okay, so when this molecule collides against the container, don't forget it's a totally elastic collision, right? There will be no loss of energy and it's going to reflect at the same angle that it is that it was incident. Okay, so recall that the force that this molecule exerts on the walls is going to depend on the change of momentum of the particle. Remember that? There is an important relationship in mechanics that relates the force. Here you go. There is an important relationship in mechanics, physics 120, that relates the force with the change in momentum of a particle. So what is this relation? 
I'm gonna write that down here for you. So you can remember that. He go force. Actually, it's net force, right? Don't forget, it's net force. It's not just any type of force. Net force applied to a particle is what? Is the change in momentum. P divided by delta T. And that's what the book is illustrating right in here. You have, yeah, they made a mistake here, right? There you go. You have an initial momentum in this direction, okay? Oh yeah, that's right, here you go. The initial momentum is in this direction, but there's no mistake here. He, he, he did it right, okay? Initial momentum is from the left to the right downwards. What you have here this is not the initial momentum, but it's minus the initial momentum, right? And then you have the final momentum from the right to the left at a given angle. Okay? Don't forget that momentum is a vector. So I, I'm going to put a vectorial sign for everything here that's a vector. Here you go. vector sign as well right and I am going to go delta P is what delta P is final momentum minus initial momentum right just a matter of changing the letters here final momentum minus initial momentum Going back to the book, final momentum minus initial momentum. So our delta P in this case is going to be in the horizontal direction like that, which is going to be the direction of the force to apply to the particle. Because the particle is interacting with the wall during the collision, so the force that the particle applies to the wall is from the left to the right. Okay, so that's how we start our derivation. So what else we know about this force? What else we know about the change in momentum? Okay, so let's assume that, remember that there is only a change in momentum along the x direction, not along the y direction. If you take a look at the drawing, right? Let's take again, let's look at it here again, right in here. Okay, there is no change in momentum of the particle along the y direction during the collision. There is only a change in momentum along the x direction because this wall is in the vertical direction. So any change that happens in the momentum is going to be due to the x direction of the x motion of the particle. So, so we can say that the delta P of the particle, here you go, we can say that uh, delta P, I want to write that down here for you. We can say that for this particular model, the y component of the final momentum minus the y component of the initial momentum is going to be equal to zero. It's going to be equal to zero. Similarly, the z component is going to be equal to zero too. The only thing that's going to be different of zero is going to be the x component of the change in momentum. I'm going to even take out the vector sign 
to simplify my notation. What is going to be different of zero is the change of momentum along the x direction. That's going to be different of zero. And that we are going to find out how much it is. So let's calculate what is going to be this change in momentum along the x direction. OK? So it's. So let's assume that the mass of the particle is m. OK? So here you go. So it's going to be m times the initial velocity of the particle along the x direction. OK? And because we have total in tot, uh, totally elastic collision, the final momentum is going to have the same magnitude on the x velocity with the difference that the sign is going to be opposite, right? Remember that? Let's take a look again. Let's take a look at the drawing. The drawing, you know, tells tell us a lot. The drawing tells us a lot about this motion. Initially, the particle is moving from the left to the right, which is a positive direction, and then it's going to move from the right to the left, which is a negative direction. So when we do the mass, when you take the change in momentum along the x direction, what do you get? We're not going to get zero. We're going to get something else that's different of zero. We are taking the direction from the left to the right being positive. In this specific case, we end up getting a change in momentum that's negative, okay? Twice the momentum that we have before, okay? That's very important. That's going to be my change in momentum, the magnitude of the change in momentum. If I, go, if I use just the magnitude from now on to simplify our equations and we can eliminate the negative sign and we get this type of relationship between for the change of momentum of the particle colliding of each gas molecule colliding against the walls of the container okay then the book got it right. That's no problem. Here you go. See that? Change the moment along the x direction is 2m vx. No problem. The problem is right in here. That's the problem. This is a mistake. I have seen other books as well. You know, they use the wrong relation to get the right result. There's a better way of deriving the equations that we want to find out by using the correct procedure. So how is that? Let's see how, how it goes, right? I just want to remind you that the force that the particle applies to the wall is going to be given by what? The force that the particle applies to the wall, here you go. It's going to be given by this relation here, right? Let's put here magnitude so you don't have to deal with vectors. It's going to be magnitude of delta P over delta T. Delta T is always positive, okay? 
So if we do everything right, and, and, and there's more, I'm going to put, I'm not going to put the, the capital delta, I'm going to put a lowercase delta instead. There's an important difference here. Which is what this delta t lowercase delta is, is all about. This lowercase delta is how long it takes for the particle to collide against the wall of the container. Okay, that's what it means. During a collision, you know, the particle is going to decelerate, it's going to deform, and then it's going to bounce back. And there will be a small delta t during this process. Okay. So think about that. So now what my, the force that the party is going to exert on the wall is going to be something like that. The faster the particle is moving, the stronger the force it's going to be. That's what you have to picture in your mind. But there is a problem. It's very difficult to calculate this delta T. It's very difficult. The book assumes that this delta t is the time that the particle takes to move twice the length of the container. Okay? But that's not how it goes. The force is equal to delta p over delta t, where delta t is the time that takes for the particle to collide against the wall. And not that round trip that the book shows. Okay? But like I said, there is a better way of doing this calculation. And I'm going to spell it out to you. I found that in one of the books. I, I look at every possible book out there. I, like I said, the mistake that your book made, other books have made as well. But I finally found the right way in this book here, the right way of calculating that. University of Physics, Young and Friedman. Okay. And it is at a level that is possible to understand for everybody. Doesn't require any calculus whatsoever. And you will be able to understand that, okay? So let's see how we can calculate that. The way we do it, and I like this procedure, here you go. We consider the wall of the container. Right in here. You know, let's see here. I'm going to do it a different way. Here you go. Here's the wall of the container. Right? Here you Oh gosh. Get it again. Now it should be right. Okay. Let's increase the thickness of this line. And what else? We have to consider a cylinder. There's a very smart way of deriving. Here you go. Here's a cylinder. You know, let me see here. Uh, I'm going to do it a different way. A given cylinder of area A. Imaginary cylinder. Cylinder has cylindrical walls, of course. You go. Mm. 
Okay, side walls of the cylinder. Consider a cylinder, imaginary cylinder, in which you have a bunch of molecules in there. Okay, I'm gonna put some molecules, very small particles. Here it goes. Some of them are in are the very extreme right. Right? Is a entering. The cylinder has this velocity component from the right to the left. There is another one that's already there inside. Okay, they are all moving towards the wall. The other one is about to hit the wall. Like that. I'm going to put a dashed line here. So you can have the illusion. Uh, here you go, better. Yeah, you can have the illusion. This one here is about to hit the wall. And they're all moving from the right to the left. Some of them are also moving from the left to the right. Okay. Have this picture in your mind. And what else? Let's say that this cylinder here has a given length D. Oh. Here you go. A given length D. On the top of that, we also have molecules outside the cylinder that are also moving towards the cylinder. Eventually, I'm going to get there, right? Some, they're either moving towards the cylinder or all the way the cylinder. Remember, there is a bunch of molecules. We're talking about a vogadro number of molecules. It's a huge number of molecules. So I cannot draw all of them here. They're all moving with this velocity along the x direction towards the, the wall of the cylinder. Okay, so first step, like I said, is to find out what's the change in momentum. I'm going to use that yet. I haven't used that yet in my accomplishment, but I'm going to use it very soon. The next step is to have a visual picture of the number of molecules that are inside the cylinder that are, going to, that are about to collide against this wall. Okay, so what's going to be this number of molecules? Okay, what's going to be the number of these molecules? I'm going to call the number of these molecules N. Here you go. N mole molecules inside the cylinder of lengths D and area A. I didn't put the area there. Let's put the area again. You go. Oh. Area A. Okay, so here you go. Going back there. Area A. Okay, we know. We know that these molecules ha have a velocity, V sub x. All we need is the x component of the velocity. That's what matters. That's what matters, okay? And, and by the way, I don't need this V0 here because the V0 doesn't change, right? 
the velocity doesn't change. So p sub x I'll call that V not X just for you know. And I go, there is a relationship between the D and the velocity of these molecules. Okay, I can write down that uh, D is going to be equal to V not X times a delta t, but it's what this delta t is not the same delta t that you saw there, okay? At least at this point in time, I'm going to call that capital delta t, capital delta t, where capital delta times uh, capital delta t is the time that this molecule at the very edge takes to reach the wall, okay? To takes to reach the wall there at the other end. And now having said that, I know that the number of molecules Not the number of molecules, but the volume of this cylinder can be here written as the volume of the imaginary cylinder can be here written can be written as what? Can be written in terms of d, right? You go. So I'll write that down here. V for the volume is going to be d times the area of the cylinder, which can be, and the volume can be here written as v a v naught x delta t. That's what we have. So what is so let's say, assume that we have, assume we have n molecules inside the cylinder, you know, because the velocity, back, because these particles, these molecules are moving in a random fashion. In a random fashion means there is no, you know what I wrote that before, right? There is no preferential direction of motion. There is no preferential direction in their motion. Okay. We can say that half of these molecules are approaching are approaching the wall and and the other half are moving away from the wall okay so what we're going to have so what does it mean? In amount of time delta t, right? What does it mean? Only n over two molecules collide against the wall. That's what it means. Make sense, right? But what else? What else we can do? 
So think about that. One molecule is going to produce a, a given force, right? Delta P over delta T. So a bunch of molecules colliding against, against the wall are going to produce another amount of force. Make sense? Okay. So what we have to do, we have to determine what is the force that all those n over 2 molecules are producing into the wall of the container. And don't forget, it's a large, it's a huge number of molecules that are doing that in a very small amount of time. Okay? So what we have to do, the net change in momentum, I'm going to write that down now. Here you go. The net change in momentum of my, not just this delta P here, here you go. The net force of all those molecules now is going to be given by a delta P. Then I'm going to call it capital P because it's a bunch of molecules divided by a delta T. And this capital P is going to be what? Is going to be n number of molecules times the change of momentum. Hey, wait a minute. I'm going to put the n right in here. But it's only half of those molecules are about to collide against the wall. Here you go. Divided by 2. Oh, n divided by 2. What else are we to do? We're going to do something else. We are going to divide that by the volume, the total volume, and multiply by the total volume. There's a reason why we do that. That's the little trick that we end up discovering when we derive those things. Okay? For don't forget that this volume that I see here, I'm going to replace with this relationship and I'm going to leave this V the way it is. Okay? So, let's do it. Plug it in here. So far, this delta T is different from this delta T. So far. Okay. What else do we have? Remember that this V not X is the same as this V not X, right? Remember that. And by the way, I am forgetting here about the right way of doing that is to put a magnitude here too, okay? I, I should have put that before. So let's put the magnitude all over. It's not gonna change much our reasoning. It's just to keep up with the notation of the book that I have here. And also keep up with the fact that I'm taking the magnitude of delta P as well. We are emphasizing that the V not X is a positive quantity. Here we go. And is a magnitude here. This is also a magnitude here. Let's go to the next step now. The two is gonna this two is gonna cancel out with this two. Remember, the only two, only half of molecules that are inside that cylinder are going to collide against the wall. The other half has already collided and are moving away from, from the wall. Okay, we are going to cancel this two with this two. We are going to have the density of molecules per volume. This V naught X is going to combine with this V naught X. It's going to become a square. Okay. And let me organize everything. I'm going to put my A here upstairs.
I'm gonna put my V here downstairs. Everything. Remember, that's the net force, right? And we still have a delta T. We have another delta T here. Here you go. N divided by V is the gas density. It's related to the gas density. Okay? And I'm going to here write this equation. He goes, just to let me get. I'm going to here write like that. Here you go, V. And then I'm going also to here write this delta T. Right this way. So let's take a look at this equation. The force that the gas exerts on the wall is going to be directly proportional to the density of molecules in the container. The higher the density, the higher the pressure. It's going to depend on the mass of each molecule. The heavier the molecule is, it's going to depend on the velocity of the molecule. The faster it goes, the higher is going to be the, the force. And then we have this funny term here. And I'm going to tell you how to get rid of it. Okay. Don't forget, this delta T here is how long the molecule takes to move from, when, from one end of your cylindrical container to the wall. Okay? Whereas this delta T here is how long the collision between the molecule takes with, with the wall. So what I'm going to do? I'm going to do the following. I'm going to start shrinking my imaginary cylinder to the point where this delta t here is going to become equal to this other lower delta t. Okay? That's what I'm going to do. So, let us shrink our imaginary cylinder, make it smaller, make the D smaller and smaller until our delta T coincides with the other delta T. Here you go. Until the capital delta T coincides until Okay, so that's the little trick that we use to get the right result. Just by shrinking our imaginary cylinder, we can make this delta T equal to the period of rebound of each molecule against the cylinder. When you do something like that, now we get the force that all those molecules exerts on the wall. And there is one more thing. There is one more thing. Remember, we shrunk the length of the cylinder, but we didn't do anything with the area. We didn't do anything with the area. Because we didn't do anything with the area, you can have a bunch of molecules colliding almost simultaneously there. Okay? And now we have something else too. We have this area here that you see. Right? If we take this area to the left side of my equation, what do we get? We are going to get the pressure that the gas make on against the wall of the cylinder. Here you go. If we divide both sides of our, our equation by A, we get the pressure, right? 
that the gas exerts on the wall of the container. And this pressure is going to depend on the density of molecules, the mass of the molecule, and the velocity of the molecules as well. There's one more thing that we can do. We didn't finish that yet. Okay. Strictly speaking, and, and now I'm going to drop this knot, this lower, this knot uh, subscript here. Okay, it doesn't have to be initial velocity, by the way. Here you go. Each more, don't forget that each molecule has a different velocity, right? Don't forget that. So, strictly speaking, I should put Vix in there. I'm not going to do that because I'm going to simplify my notation. Here you go. I don't. Your book does that too. I'm gonna drop the knot, the initial velocity. You know, the x doesn't change, so there is no need to put that knot in there. If if the velocity along the x direction changes, then we have to put it there. We have to keep the knot there. Let's see. Let's see if you are forgetting anything else. Yeah, looks good, right? So at this point in time, what did I use? Let's let's just summarize what we did so far. Summarize. So you can you don't you don't you don't get lost, right? Summarize what we did so far. One. Found the change in momentum. Two. Use the change in momentum to find out the force applied to the wall of the container. And what else? Got the pressure that the ensemble, assembly of molecules apply to the wall and I'm going to here write this equation here he goes he's going to be my pressure I'm going to put lowercase p but that this p is a different p is 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 a scalar p p for pressure not momentum if I have the arrow there at the top should be momentum but pressure is not a vector it's a scalar that's the relation. We didn't finish yet. We can do more. Let's not forget that what we have here, you know, let's not forget, let's not forget that V sub X is different. It's different for each molecule. One molecule may be moving faster than the other, okay? So what we have to do here is the following. We have to come up and say, look, this velocity is in reality an average velocity, an average velocity in the x direction, okay? And there is more, one more thing, okay? One more thing, one more thing. Okay. All molecules have a x, y, and z components of the velocity. And I can here write that, that's the following. Here you go. V square. is going to be equal to what? V square is going to be equal to Vx square this part of the book did correctly Vy square and Vz square 
dy square and this z square. But we can also say but uh, you know it varies right from molecule to molecule vx vy vz and even even the v is going to vary so let's take the average of all the velocities of all the molecules that's in this container i'm going to do like that so here you go the average of the net velocity square I'm going to put AV here, is equal to the average of the square of the velocity along the x direction, along the y direction, and along the z direction. We're taking an average here. Oh, actually, here, we, we're going to do a better, a, a different notation, okay? A different, it's not the, it, it's a very important difference, okay? In a matter of, uh, is the average of the square, okay? That's how we should interpret that. It's not the square of the average. So it's important to note that is the average of the square. It's not the, is, is, let's see, is the square, yeah, is the average of the square, not the square of the average, okay? So here you go, I'm going to put that the notation here. I'm going to get there, here you go. Just replace that with the y. The average of the square of the velocity in the z direction, of the square of the z component of the velocity, of the y component of the velocity, the average of the x, of the square of the x component of the velocity. Okay? What we have right in here, in the equation, should be the average of this square. Okay? So here goes this one right in here. Because we have a bunch of molecules I'm going to put that like that. That's because we have several molecules with different velocities. So what else? What else can we do? We didn't finish yet. We didn't finish yet. Okay, because all molecules are moving in a random direction, direction something nice happens okay what's that because all mole we are going to have that all those averages in the x and y direction they're going to be the same this random motion is not motion in a preferential direction Having said that, I can here write this relation like that as being, you know, this vy is going to become vx, the vz is going to become vx as well. And now we have what? We have 3 times the average of the square of the velocity in the x direction. And I can here write this x component as being what? Oh, as being what? One third of the average of the square of the net velocity. and replace it right in here. 
you'll see that we already, oh, not only we're relating P to V square, we're also relating V. We're relating P, V to V square. Do you see that happening here? Okay, so let's replace it. This one right here. Go. We have one third. I'm going to put this one third right here in front. And I'm going to do something else too. I'm going to multiply the right side of this equation by 2 and divide it by 2 as well. Why is that? Because I want to, oh, I want to relate the kinetic energy to the macroscopic variables of my gas. See, that's the kinetic energy here. But it's the average kinetic energy. And the so-called translational kinetic energy. See, this is the translational kinetic energy. You go, can I, can I write that again? I'm going to put that like that. I want, I am emphasizing the fact that this is a translational kinetic energy, not rotational, not vibrational. Here you go, like that. And what else? I can go ahead, write PV, the left side of my equation, as being equal Let's, let's not forget that this translation of kinetic energy is just for a single molecule, right? But if I multiply by N, it should be the translational kinetic energy of the whole gas. So I'm going to put it a 1 right in here. And then, here you go, the V pass to the other side. That's the kinetic, translational kinetic energy of my entire gas. PV is two-thirds of the kinetic translation energy. According to the ideal gas law, PV is also equal to NRT. Okay? So let's not forget. Do you see the N here in my equation? Let, let me wrote, write that down again. I'm going to write it uh, in... Here you go. I'm going to put it in a different format before we... I'm going to do the following. I'm going to pass my V right now. Right? I'm going to need my V. I'm going to put my N right in here. I'm going to move this one a little bit below. Let's take a look. Let's start comparing our equations here. PV, PV. See that? This N that you see here is related to this N. Right? The, ball, the number of moles of the gas is related to the number of molecules that are in the gas. Number of moles of the gas is related to the number of moles that are in the gas. And everything else is going to be related to the temperature and to the R. So what we can do here, we can associate the temperature of a gas with the velocity of its molecules or the kinetic energy of its molecules. Okay, so what we have right here is the total kinetic energy of the gas. So we can go to the next step. What else can you can you do? Here you go. We're gonna make this guy equal to this guy and relate the kinetic energy 
of the particles to the temperature and the amount of molecules that we have in the gas. Okay. We solve for the kinetic translational kinetic energy. And what we get? We get three halves of NRT. And that's for an ideal gas, an equation for the ideal gas. If we want to find out the average kinetic energy of a single molecule, we divide that by N. Okay, and that by N, right? But let's not forget this N is related to the small N is related to the big N. What's the relationship between the big N and the small N? Has to do with the Avogadro number. Okay? Right? Here you go. Is small N okay. is what? Is small n the big N is the small n times the Avogadro number. Go. I'm gonna put it lower subscript a. Another way of writing down this equation. One mole of a given gas has a total of molecules that's equal to the Avogadro number. Two moles of a given gas is twice the number of Avogadro. Twice the number of Avogadro for the molecules. So small n divided by big N is going to be the inverse of the Avogadro number. So here you go. The kinetic, the translational kinetic energy of a single molecule on the average, on the average, is going to be given by R divided by Na. Three half T. Okay. So that's the derivation that we have here. Let's take a look at the book. Oh, here we go. Let's go down. We get exactly the same. The same result, but through a different way, okay? The way that they, the book did, the, the mistake of the book that the book made was this one right in here. That's a mistake that many other books make. It's not reasonable to say that the time of collision of the molecules against the wall is twice the length divided. No, that's not, that's not the right one. That's not the right way of doing it. Okay, the pressure, everything here. We got that. Average kinetic energy that this this bracket here means average the different notation Okay pressure we go and then That's the relation between the kinetic energy and the temperature We got that as well with a different constant, right? So the absolute temperature of an ideal gas is proportional to the average kinetic energy of the gas. At temperature equal to zero, the molecules don't have any kinetic energy whatsoever. Okay? One more thing is uh, that average that you saw. We give it a name. Yeah. So 
there is one more thing, right? That uh, it's in your book. I'm going to cover that with you as well. Here you go. Let's go back to this value that you see right in here, the average of the squares. Okay. Here you go. What you see right in here, the square root of this term has a name that we see all the time in physics. What you have right in here, we call it the square root, right? The square root of that. Let me get uh, what we have right in here. We call the root mean square. Root mean square velocity. Okay? The square root of that. So now I can here write my formula for the kinetic energy. Let's let me write the form for the kinetic energy first. The translation of here go, the translation of kinetic energy. Just to simplify the way we write the notation, here go. The translation of kinetic energy, here go. Is going now to be given by the square of the root mean square value. Becomes a cleaner notation. Root mean square value square. Right, you go. Right in here. Okay. One more. Go. Kinetic energy. Let's let's. There's one more equation here that we need to derive. Uh, let's not forget. Is. Here you go. This one, right? Okay, let's go back to this equation here. Here you go. Remember, this is a constant, universal constant of the gas and the Avogadro number that doesn't vary either. It's always the same. This ratio here, instead of keep on carrying all the time as two different constants, what do we do? We give it a new name. We call it the Boltzmann constant and represent it by the letter K. Multiple constant, you go ahead, divide this number by this number, and you get a given value. You can do that yourself. Okay, that's just another simpler way of representing the kin average kinetic energy of per molecule in a gas. One more thing. Uh, what we have here is supposed to be the average kinetic energy per molecule in the gas, where this is the mass of the molecule and the root mean square of the molecule, okay? So what else do we have to do? We're going to do the following. We are going to rewrite what you see right in here in terms of our constant, Boltzmann constant, okay? This one right in here. So let's go ahead and rewrite that like that. And what else we get? We get something interesting that's going to be the root mean square of the velocity of a given molecule in the gas. See, this two is going to cancel out with this other two downstairs. 
and we can proceed to get the root mean square velocity of the of a given molecule. Yeah. Just by taking the square root of the term on the right. Now it's no longer the square of the he comes, might be like just the root mean square now. RMS. We go. We go like that. Three K T over M. I put everything upstairs. Okay, the higher the temperature, the faster the molecule travels. The heavier the molecule is, the slower it travels. Here is a universal constant, the Boltzmann constant. So if you know the mass of the molecule and the temperature that it's subjected to, you can find the root mean square value of the velocity of that molecule. So here you go. Book. Let's take a look. Let's finish this chapter with an example. So we can, you know, find the average translation of kinetic energy and the root mean speed of O2 molecules in air at room temperature. Okay, so let's look, let's do that. So that's the equation. First, we're gonna, we're gonna use two, two different equations, right? Kinetic energy. Average relational kinetic energy, here you go. That's the average kinetic energy. There, okay, here you go. Note C that the average kinetic translational kinetic energy of an ideal gas does not depend on the type of the gas. Depends only on the Boltzmann constant and the temperature. Okay? So let's take a look at the solution here of the problem. We have to change the temperature from degree C to Kelvin. 20 degrees C is, two, is 293 Kelvins. We substitute this temperature here. The Boltzmann constant is given by that ratio that you saw. And notice that the kinetic, translational kinetic energy of the O2 molecule at 20 degrees C is the same as the translational kinetic energy of any other gas at this temperature, at room temperature. Can be nitrogen, oxygen, CO2, because it depends only on the temperature. That's surprising, isn't that? However, the root mean square, no, the root mean square is different. It's going to vary from gas to gas. Okay, because it depends on the mass of the molecules that you have in there. Okay, so the heavier the molecule is, the slower it's going to travel. The slower its root mean square is going to be. So here you go, for the case of O2 molecules, the speed is 478 meters per second. Have you thought about that? 478 meters per second this is supersonic speed. Speed of the sun is around 330. So the, those molecules travel at the average velocity of uh, 1.5 the speed of the sound approximately okay co2 molecules at room temperature here you go find the average translation of kinetic 
energy and the root oh let's see for co2 okay same as o2 see that because it doesn't depend on the mass of the molecules but what about the root mean square the root mean square value is 408 lower than o2 because co2 is heavier more massive you do not have to worry about the maxwell boltzmann distribution i think this is too much uh, too much for this course level okay you can skip that and we are done with this chapter we are not going to do temperature and reaction rates we are not going to do diffusion and the next thing that we're going to cover is going to be chapter 14. so thank you for being here don't forget to give a like in there or even to subscribe to this channel okay and so I can be motivated to make better, more and better videos for you all folks. Okay, see you next time. Bye-bye.